Uh, we're ready for our next talk, which is uh, by Justin Ginsberg, a glass artist and uh, assistant professor and head of the glass area at the University of Texas at Arlington. He's going to give a talk about new approaches uh, to artistic experimentation with glass with some pretty interesting methods. So take it away. Hmm. everybody hear me? Yeah, perfect. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Sebastian EHSM for inviting me out and uh, Berlin Glass, uh, who also brought me over from Texas to do a residency, so I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so first I wanted to try to make a little bit of a connection between uh, this very science kind of um, ideas that are working here and then of course I'm working in art, and I think the closest connection maybe is the method in which I work. Um, so I, I pulled a very academic uh, resource, Wikipedia, for the scientific method. Uh, but just to look at you know, how we, m one might approach uh, an idea or work or an experiment, and you'll often hear um, artists talk about um, their work as an experiment, because we're not exactly sure what will happen, and we want to we see what the result is and then try to make an adjustment thereof. Um, but one of the things that I really... Um, responded to well was, was letting reality speak for itself. So, so we all know glass in a lot of different varieties from windows to vases and everything else, but uh, the material itself is pretty alien. So if you've ever seen it, and maybe you'll get an opportunity today to see uh, one particular method, um, that, that the material is very, um, it's very odd. We don't always know how it's gonna behave, and so the practice of working with it is always about maybe trying to control it and, uh, and to try to get it to kind of do what we'd, what we'd like it to do. Um, so when I was in graduate school in my master's program, I was really interested in uh, looking at calligraphy, actually the, the gesture of making a mark. Uh, and mostly what I was interested in is thinking about the brush and thinking about how these thousands of tiny little bristles, you know, you get paint on them and then how you apply that pressure, how you apply that movement makes a very, very distinct mark. And so a lot of it was me trying to deconstruct um, this mark or this action and, and really thinking about these very individual parts. So, um, you know, this is actually flat glass. Uh, and what I've done is, is tried to figure out a way to pull out these very fine threads of glass. So somewhere between uh, a hair thickness to maybe 100 times that thickness. And so this isn't a very normal process. Um, but it's something that um, I started to really think about in fiber optics, so that this industry has really developed this method of producing these very fine uh, threads. And so I'm not working with that particular type of glass, but was kind of trying to invent a new way to kind of look at that. So, so what I do actually is I take, oh, let's see if I can go back. There you go. Um, so this is uh, molten glass. It's uh, 1160 Celsius. And it's a lot like the consistency of honey. So you actually have to keep the glass moving, otherwise it will drip off. So if you've ever taken honey and tried to get it from the honey pot to your tea, you always have to kind of turn a little bit to make sure you don't drip across the table. So the material is a lot like that, just a little bit hotter. And so what I've done is I basically just use a piece of, uh, I get a little bit of glass. It's actually on the end of a steel rod. <laughs> wow, hold on. Is there a volume somewhere? It's gonna be really loud. Up there. Oh yeah, there we go. We can just turn that off. Okay. Um, all right. Try this one. Nope. So I guess these videos aren't playing. But um, so we we'll go back to the other one, maybe. Um, so so I'm basically just taking tweezers and I'm grabbing the end of the glass and just walking away from it. And you can kind of see right there, I'm actually doing two at a time to kind of uh, do double time, but you can barely see at the end there these very, very fine threads of glass being pulled. And so this was one of the methods I was trying to develop in order to make the work, but what eventually happened was, um, hopefully this plays, yeah, there we go. So I would actually pull them about 20 to 50 meters long and across these ladders, and what you start to see is that the accumulation of these parts uh, you can actually start to see the pieces. And then the other thing that was happening, which really changed the way that I started working with the material, is you see this kind of very slight undulating, kind of like a wave. And so actually when the strands are on the ground, they're perfectly flat. 
but if you try to lift them up, they actually have an incredible amount of, of flexibility. So, so I started to kind of think about um, the tensile properties of glass, which after working in it about 10 years, I never really considered glass to be a very flexible material when it's cold. So, so I really started to develop a new type of work, I think, or I hope it's new. Um, and so these are, these are those strands of glass that I've hand pulled. This is about uh, 15 meters, 20 meters. I'm a little rough on my metric, but somewhere around there. Um, and it took me about two years to figure out actually how to hang the pieces. So, so you can barely touch them. If you squeeze too hard, they break. Uh, when you move them, they get all tangled. So it's really kind of taken a, a couple of years to figure out how to, to make them, how to transport them, and then how to hang them, and then, um, and, then how to, and then how to kind of present this. And so I was thinking about a lot of ideas besides just the material value of it or the material kind of aesthetics. Um, and really thinking about how interesting it was that this very thin thread that you could barely see, you could barely touch, you could barely work with, um, but then you put it in this whole group of them and then it becomes something very different. Um, and a lot of this is challenging uh, when you learn a craft or a trade or something that you have all these rules. So, you know, broken glass is bad. If you see a bubble in glass, that's a flaw. So we're kind of trained with this mentality. So it takes a little bit of work to get past um, past these kind of mental blocks and then accept these things as, as, as maybe a potential for something else. So, so these pieces actually break all the time and they break as they're hanging as well, but, and, and you just kind of have to get past the mentality that that breaking is bad in some ways. Um, so I, I continued kind of looking at how far I could, I could challenge the, the tensile properties. It's how flexible could glass be? How far could I take it before it would break? And because this is all by hand, each piece is, is unique to itself. So, so some strands could bend a lot, other ones couldn't, and that's all just in my hand, how fast I walked, uh, how much glass I grabbed at a time, all these very, um, these kind of tiny variables, and that's something about the hand, uh, but training your body to be almost like a machine where you can kind of do this consistently. So you can see in this, in this particular piece, uh, in the center there, that I'm really trying to get towards bringing the glass back around itself. You know, can I actually coil it all the way back around um, and making these, you know, these pieces. And you can see on the bottom, the bottom section there, um, all the broken ones. And so they actually get tangled and stay straight. So you actually kind of start to recognize that the glass uh, wants to be straight, but we're putting it under this, this incredible amount of tension. And there's another detail. And all the straight ones going down are all the, the strands that couldn't make that particular bend. So, um, so basically, after years of working with this and walking back and forth across the studio all day long, five, ten kilometers a day, something like that, it just was like, this is crazy. And, um, you know, it's like, what can I do? And it's like, obviously, the wheel. The wheel is a, a brilliant invention. So, so I built this gadget, which is a bicycle tire just with a pulley, and I attached the glass to a little piece of metal on it, and I just start spinning it. So I kind of, kind of became a glass spinster, I guess. Um, so again, a couple of years of testing, um, one of the problems I had was that glass actually uh, um, shrinks when it cools. So if it's around something that's rigid, like a piece of wood, um, all the glass will break as it starts to cool. So I had to find a material that would actually, would, would actually have a little bit of a give to it, as well as, as well as kind of just work out a lot of the other issues with it. And then the next issue is to try to figure out how to get the glass off the wheel, because they're these very, very fragile pieces. So, and unfortunately, it takes longer to get it off than it does to put it on. So I actually have to coil the glass off the piece. Um, and I get these really, really nice loops. And then um, I can adjust, like you can kind of see that the glass is staying in this round form, but I can adjust um, a couple things in the machine so I can actually keep them very straight if I want to. Um, so this was something that was really kind of recent. This is in the last maybe three months that I figured this out. And I started working on these new pieces. So this is 5,280 feet of hand-pulled glass in a, hold on, let me get my metric, 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters by 5 centimeter box. And so, again, I was really thinking about distance, the distance traveled, the distance made. And my bicycle wheel actually has a little odometer on it. So I just, I just pull until the odometer tells me how far. And I'm really kind of thinking about these standardization of measurements. Like, you know, I don't really work in metric, and it's a bit insane that we have these different measurements, and then, and then how important are they really, and what do they actually mean? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, and so a lot of this, especially with glass, we think about light. And so with this work, I've also been thinking about light not only as something that's aesthetic, but uh, light as a type of measurement of distance or a type of measurement of speed. And, and the first question that anybody always asks me, especially in an exhibition, is why no color? You know, and I, my answer has always been because light has all colors. And so I really started kind of thinking about light in a lot of different ways, a little bit different than, we, than we'd normally kind of think about it in the, in the art world. Uh, and again, you see all those straight lines. These are the, the strands that wouldn't particularly make that bent. Um, and then I started thinking about volume and distance. So this is actually, where is it? Uh, 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters by 4 centimeters, and si still that mile. So now thinking about that same distance being condensed even tighter and tighter, um, and, and it's, it's, I like this idea of compacting these, these things that we, we deem as far, maybe, uh, but you can put it in this very, like, very small box. Um, so I had the opportunity to work at Berlin Glass for five weeks. Um, and work on some of these ideas. I shipped my machine there, and then eventually had an exhibition last week. And um, so these are some of the pieces that I was working on. Uh, so this is about 15 or 20 meters tall. And uh, these are actually quite a bit thicker, and so we're pulling the glass long and straight, and then we're bending it around a piece of wood to get this U shape. Um, and I started kind of thinking a little bit more about the fiber optics, um, only we use a glass that's not as, as pure as what they use. They use a quartz glass which is the very purest form you can actually use. And I'm using a soda lime glass, which actually doesn't have the same optical properties. Uh, so, but there's an interest there because the glass actually reflects the light as well as, as, as makes the light travel down. So you can see on the tips of these things, they're all glowing. So the light's being reflected and being funneled through each piece of glass. Uh, the machine made it into the exhibition. So there's my, my new rig that I built here. Um, and it has a 250 meter a uh, strand of glass that I wrapped around it, and you can just barely see it off the bottom of the wheel, uh, that strand, and actually goes up a couple of stories into this uh, six-story abandoned building that I did the exhibition in. Um, I thought it would be the first piece to break in the show, but everybody eventually saw this like little spider web, this very thin strand, and, and became this kind of very precious thing. <clears throat> so more strands, drapes, so that they, they have all these wires all over the building, and it seemed like an interesting connection between wires and electricity and light and how they all move. Um, so I suspended the glass in front of the window and really kind of looked at it throughout the day. And um, you know, at nighttime you could barely see it, but during the day as the light moved, it would kind of show up and disappear. So it was something that I kind of enjoyed. Um, more glass that I'm trying to test this tensile uh, capabilities. It was just a hose reel uh, abandoned in the space. So we took the strands of glass and we just wrapped it around this this reel and what you can see at the top is, is how far, the, which pieces of glass could take that type of tension and which pieces of glass couldn't. Again, all just based on these tiny nuances that you'd never really know. Uh, so you, you pull all day and then you wrap it and then some break and some don't. So I kind of like that, that um, unknown. And, so, and it's also why I, I hand make them and I don't just go buy these fiber optics. Um, so this is one process that I've been working on for about five years to try to see how I can work with these parts and pieces. Uh, but I always overlap my ideas. So, so the other projects are things that I'm thinking about is the compressive uh, capabilities of the glass. So how much, how much compression can it take? How much force can it take? And so this is another um, rule in glass that I'm, I'm trying to break, you know, besides working thin and, and fragile like this, is um, one of the rules we tell our students is like glass and water don't really like each other. In fact, if you want glass to break, you put water on it and the glass will break. So seemed like a great place for me to start. So I started doing these tests, and this is about 80% speed um, of trying to cast glass into water. So this is um, a 1,160 degree uh, glass being poured into a giant vat of water, uh, a glass vat, that is, um, and, then, and then filming it. And so I actually kind of found myself uh, back, I'll play it one more time, but back at the uh, making these marks, this kind of calligraphy, so to speak, which I wasn't really intending to do. Uh, but I really loved how the glass moved through there. And what's really happening is that the, the surface of the glass is being shocked and frozen immediately, but the interior of the glass is still moving. So you get this very odd undulating form, this kind of back and forth kind of flow, and you actually get to see how the glass moves, and which I really only intended to try to document through video and photography and try to capture this kind of 
very quick moment. So all this happens just in a matter of a couple of seconds. What we found out is that actually if you move really quickly, you can save the glass. So uh, we, we came out with a system to try to pull the glass out as we're pouring it into the water and, and capture these forms. So this isn't me manipulating the glass in any way other than putting glass into water and trying to save what the result looks like. And, and it, it became like a signature. Um, everyone is different. You know, so this was, this was one of the first ones we actually were able to save that didn't totally shatter into a million pieces, which most of them do. Um, this is another one. So you get this very kind of random effect. Um, but I like that, you know, that I'm not trying to control what the tell the glass what to do, but I'm letting the material um, instruct me a little bit more. Um, so that's kind of what I have. Um, uh, you're welcome to check out my website and some other work and tests. The, the glass into water is is really new and it's something that will, I'm sure will take a couple more years for me to kind of work through, but uh, I appreciate uh, y'all listening and look forward to seeing some more of the stuff that you guys are working on. So thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, we got time for questions. Oh, yeah. If uh, anyone have any questions for Justin? There, back there. The water piece, are they annealed? Uh, they are not annealed. And, and what Nadanya is referring annealing in glass is uh, taking the stress out of the glass. So normally, this is another rule in glass, you have to cool it at a very specific rate, depending on its thickness, to ensure that the interior temperature of the, of the mass of glass and the exterior surface temperature don't have a greater differential of about five degrees. So, so this is a common practice. You make a vase or a bowl, you put it in an oven, it cools very slowly overnight, and we call that annealing. This glass is not annealed. Uh, none of my glass actually is really annealed. The, the threads in, in that type of glass, the interior, <clears throat> excuse me, the interior and the exterior are so close to each other and they're so thin, they actually would technically be stress-free, you know, that the, they're cooling close enough at the same rate. The glass in the water is, is su super not annealed. The outside goes right to about, you know, 100, 200 degrees maybe, and the inside's still molten hot. So um, I don't know if the pieces will survive. <laughs> I have them still, they haven't broken any further, but uh, if you looked under a polariscope, which is a way that you can look at stress in glass, you would see an enormous amount of stress. So, um, so that's something that I'm actually gonna start to try to utilize is to be able to uh, build these boxes so when you look at the glass, actually all you see is the stress, which actually shows up as, as rainbow colors. So, so again, it, it's, it splits the light and it shows the stress. So, so we'll see if they survive. I don't know how long I have to wait before I can give it the okay, but they're in my studio, just you know, sitting there. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Hello. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know about um, <clears throat> something called the Prince Rupert straw. I do. Yeah, this is a great experiment and uh, something that they've recently came out on, uh, mm -hmm. like a YouTube doing like a I don't know, like thirty thousand frames per second. Uh, and if you guys don't know what it is, they basically take a drop of glass. And, and then you actually shock it, so that it's, it's very, very, um, it's not annealed. It has an enormous amount of stress. And when you take a pair of pliers and you, and you, and it actually looks like a drip, and you squeeze the back with the pliers, it creates a, this like um, kind of reaction, almost, almost explosive reaction, and the, and the drop becomes like, you know, a million tiny little pieces in, a, in an instant. So, and, and what that's great about is showing how much stress can be stored up in the glass, um, even though it seems fine, just that little cut and this thing just, just blows. So they're actually a little bit dangerous, but, um, but they're really fun to play with if you have safety glasses, yeah. <laughs> so you are doing those also, uh, dropping the, the, the glass it's, on the it's water? It's very similar, the glass. Um, these are really thin. Um, uh, the, what the, the ones that I've seen at least are, are f not a very big amount of glass. You know, they're maybe this big and maybe like you know, this thick or so, but, um, but so yeah, there's a, there's a similar thing happening in my, my, my glass water castings that, that yes, if you, if you probably hit it with a hammer, it would, it, it would have a, it would it kind of explode in some way. <laughs> so you wouldn't want to drop it, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, the exhibition was, uh, we borrowed an abandoned building, so they were just up for one night 
in fact, the really big piece that was hanging, we, we made a performance out of it, and I had, I had some help, um, a couple other artists who were helping me make the work, and we, we destroyed it in front of the audience by, by hitting it at the top and letting the glass kind of crash down. But um, uh, the Museum Kunstpalast in Dusseldorf uh, just acquired one of the boxes, and it'll be, it's two kilometers in a box, so I, it'll be my metric, my homage, homage to metric system. So. They should have that on display at some point, maybe hopefully in the next year, but they, they have one of those pieces so you can see. Hey, um, do you do any interpretations of the shapes, of the random shapes that uh, you get out of this? dripping uh, glass into water? Um, you know, I haven't, like, um, connected it with anything other than the process at this point. Um, you know, I like, I like the kind of randomness, um, and I like that it's being, you know, generally when we say we cast glass, we're pouring the glass into a form, a mold, or we're taking cold glass and putting it in a, in a mold, in a form, and melting it into it. And I like this idea of casting with no physical form around it, really, no rigid form, so that... So I kind of look at them as castings, where the water is actually cooling and pushing the glass into this particular form, uh, which is something that's way more complex than I could ever make. You know, the, these, the, the way the glass moves and then the surface quality, because the actually outside surface is totally cracked, but because the interior of the glass is still molten and still very hot, it holds everything together. So what's happening in the water with me just taking giant spoonfuls of glass and pouring it in the water is, is, is more amazing than anything I could try to make out of a mold. It would always look like I made it. This is, is, is something that's kind of a, you know, it's a phenomenon almost. And so I, I liked them just as that, but at some point they might develop into something else. But it's kind of, if you've ever seen calligraphy in a language that you don't know, you can just admire this, this, this emotion that went into like some kind of mark. And so I kind of like that relationship to it, that it, it might not be translatable, but it's still something that still has that essence. Well, great. Thanks. Thank Justin. you, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> and you'll be uh, giving a workshop. You'll be giving a workshop also. You're giving a workshop also.